Hey, Tommy, have you noticed it's a really, 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 really bad time to buy a new car? Yeah, just awful. We just drove by a bunch of dealerships on the way to work, and how many new cars were for sale? <laughs> Approximately zero. It is a ghost town across pretty much every brand. Yep, so in this episode of TFL Car Talk, um, we're going to be uh, talking about how not to get screwed buying a new car. Exactly. So we're going to give you some tips and tricks that we have learned in the last few weeks from trying to buy some new cars and hopefully give you the advice and the knowledge you need to kind of negotiate the experience. And if you're new to this podcast slash video, I'm Roman uh, Micah with the Fast Lane Car. And that over there is who? It's me. It's Tommy Micah. Yeah. And that would be my son. <laughs> uh, so we are father and son and uh, we do... Um, usually live on TFL car, TFL truck, TFL off-road, basically uh, all the TFL channels, including uh, you're rocking it on TikTok, Tommy. TFL Studios, yep. smash that like button. <laughs> yeah, smash that like button. If you want to see all of our content, go to tfl-studios.com. Uh, and of course, uh, you'll get the podcast, the websites, and the uh, videos all in one place. So Tommy, um, this weekend I put up a little post on our TFL truck community page, we got an email from a guy who wrote this, and I'll, I'll let me read what he said. And then what blew me away was the fact that we got 525 comments on this one post. Can you believe that? What's the post? Well, he's trying to buy a Bronco, and he wrote, let me get there, hold on here. He wrote, hey guys, I know you've heard rumors of dealers marking up the Broncos on reservation holders uh, that were told they would get their Broncos at MSRP. Mm -hmm. uh, I reached out to my dealer today to convert my reservation in a 2022 order and was told that if I want to get a 2022 year Bronco, they are now marking them up $5,000 over MSRP. And this is his dealer that's marking him up over yeah, MSRP? Yeah, his dealer. Yeah, okay. Yep, yep. When I made my reservation, I specifically asked them if uh, they were selling at MSRP, and they assured me that they were doing that. Now I'm told that if I want my Bronco at MSRP, I will have to wait until 2023. I feel like my dealership completely lied to me just so they can... Uh, take my money, and I'm curious if you guys have heard of anything happening to other reservation holders as well. And that was Kevin, Tommy. Uh, and then there were 525 responses. Number one, which is, this is by far the worst time to purchase a new car or vehicle and the best time to sell, which is absolutely true. So we actually have just gone through the process ourselves of buying several new cars. Uh, and of course, it helps that we're TFL. Uh, sometimes people know who we are. Uh, but we've had some pretty interesting experiences as well. So I think in this podcast slash video, we should talk about our experiences. And then uh, we've come up with some strategies to help you if you're in the new car market, how not to get screwed uh, buying a new car. So uh, let's dive right in. So first of all, so that, that, that folk uh, who's having some problems, apparently you can actually move that Bronco order to another dealership. So uh, the, the reservation lives on its own separate from the dealer. So maybe uh, to that person, if they want to, they could look for another dealer and transfer the reservation order over to someone who would honor the MSRP. Well, the, for the problem here, I mean, look at some of these comments, right? Anyone paying more than MSRP on a vehicle is part of the problem. The Bronco is all hype. Um, this is why I never buy a car before things come down, never pre-order. I saw online a Bronco at four dealerships that had a markup of $20,000. i have seen those as well. Why on earth would you buy a, um, a hot ticket item with the promise of paying MSRP? Uh, they just... Uh, out of the regular Broncos on the X-Plan, if you have one, you can also work with another dealership or use that. That's what you just said. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, like I said, there there is a lot of different comments. Drop it like a hot potato. Um, I'd cancel. Anyway, uh, you know, obviously everybody has their opinion and everybody has different uh, ideas on how to go about buying uh, new cars, but we are, we do it quite a bit uh, and we do have some uh, tricks of the trade. So once again, let's talk about, first of all, our um, experiences and then we'll talk about how you, if you're in a new car market right now, um, how you can avoid getting screwed. So let's start, let's go way back. Uh, let's talk about, before we talk about your grandma's car, let's talk about the, the newest car we bought, which was our mini SC. That's a mini electric car. We bought that about two months ago when things were just starting to get bad. Right? And if you're wondering why things are bad, there's a bunch of different reasons. Chip shortage, supply side issues. Basically, new car manufacturers are having all sorts of issues from getting the little chips that they put in the key fob uh, to getting parts for... Uh, a vehicle and all it takes is one part missing and you can't deliver a vehicle. It's not like, you know, 
if you don't have a door handle, you can go out and deliver the car without a door handle. Now, the the, the used car shortage is also affecting the new car, so... Yeah, that, I mean, that's being driven by the new car. So used, used car prices are also through the roof. They're up 30% over year, over year, over year. <laughs> and uh, uh, so basically because people can't buy new cars, they're, of course, you know, looking for used cars, and that has also driven that market through the roof. So it's not like, you know, hey, I can live without a new car. I'll just go buy a used car because you'll have the same issues with a used car. So we wanted to buy this Cooper SE, which was this, uh, basically it's a, it's a little mini Cooper that's powered by electricity, and it's a hard vehicle to find now, and it was even a couple months ago when uh, things were just starting to heat up, and what we found a lot of was uh, dealers advertising these vehicles on websites like Auto Trader, and then when we actually called them up, the vehicle is not on the lot, or it's in transit, or it has just been sold, and we found that to be the case the vast majority of the time. So we would see the listing and then contact the dealer, and they'd say, oh, sorry, this car is not actually around anymore. Yeah, that's called bait and switch, right? They, they bait you into, uh, it's illegal. <laughs> they bait you into one thing, and then they try to switch you into something else. So I, I called uh, one dealership in California, and they said they had one, and they said, oh, no, that was already sold, but would you be interested in buying this other thing? And I'm like, no, I didn't. I'm not interested in the other car. I'm interested in this one. We've also had experiences, like you said, Tommy, uh, where uh, uh, they'll say, oh, yeah, that one is coming, and then they have no firm deadline as to when it's coming, right? It's like, and and you feel like they're just uh, using um, the vehicle as bait to get you to call them than to try to get you into another vehicle or try to get a sale. Uh, uh, and that is, once again, something that's very unreputable. Uh, and because of the shortage of cars right now, it's something that, that bad dealerships are doing, and it's very commonplace. So beware of that. It's, it's out there, and it's rampant. So the only good way to know if a vehicle is actually at the dealership that you're looking to purchase from is to either drive to the dealership and see it for yourself in person or call them up and talk to a salesman because a lot of the new dealers now are going toward the online only kind of platform where they ask you to send them a message to talk to someone and even then I find it to be a little bit sketchy so you need to get someone on the phone or you need to see the car in person to know if it's there and then the other thing which is happening too is um for example, we went and uh, were interested in buying one uh, also in California, and the dealer had tacked on an $1,800 low jack security system fee and was completely unwilling to compromise on that price and completely unwilling to compromise on removing this system, which in my opinion is largely marketing uh, for, for the dealer to... Markup. It's not marketing. It's just markup, pure markup. Yeah, markup for the dealer to go yeah, this is, this is a make dev- profit on. This is a device that if your vehicle is stolen, it reports the location of the vehicle. Uh, ironically, the Mini, when we bought it, actually has that because it is, it is basically uh, um, location enabled. Uh, so BMW provides a service where the car knows where it's at and it'll tell you where it's at in basically the phone app that BMW gives you, or in this case, Mini. And I use that interchangeably because BMW owns Mini. Uh, so it'll, it'll, it'll tell you that in the app. So why would you want a, a, a device that actually tells you that when the car does it on its own? Yeah, and we said, okay, we were all set to buy it. And then I was like, hey, are there any markups? And they said, oh yeah, we've got this device. And I'm like, I don't want the device. And they said, too bad, you gotta buy it with the device. Mm. Uh, and it was it was more than that, right? There was also uh, I forget it was like clear coat or no, pin, or is it pinstriping or clear coat, something like that. I think the word you're thinking of is paint protection. Film. Oh, paint protection, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, we didn't want that either. <laughs> we don't keep the car long enough to actually worry about paint protection. Uh, so, um, and the, and you might be wondering why didn't we buy one locally? Well, we tried, uh, but once again we got that kind of bait and switch at uh, one of the local mini dealerships where they were like, oh, we have it, and we called them up and they were like, oh no, we don't have it. But would you be interested in this one? I'm like, no, I want an electric one. No, I think what they said is we don't have it, but we can put your name on the list, and yeah. then we can we can get you an order, and it'll be here in a few months. Yeah, that's right. Um, and and by the way, if you're on Auto Trader or if you're using any kind of online form, it seems to fall into two distinct baskets, um, and they're both bad. Uh, the one is you know you fill out the form and you send it out, and it's a black hole, and, and you never hear from them. And the other one is you fill it out, you send it back to them, and then you get the most annoying salesperson who uh, informs you that they don't have the vehicle, but what can they do to get you into something else right now? Uh, never really what you're looking for, you know, not not just a straight answer on an email, or worse yet, if you give your phone number and if you make that your cell phone, you're, uh, there's a dealership group in California, we did this two months ago, that every week 
calls me and every week now sends me an email. Two months ago, Tommy. So we ended up finding a mini in New Mexico um, through this dealer in Albuquerque, and it turned out to be a pretty good experience. Called them up. We were able to make the purchase happen over the phone, and the sales folks were very, very handy with that. So we flew down there. They picked us up from the airport, which was good. And it, it turned out to be a pretty good experience. There were some issues with the paperwork, of course, when we got it back to Colorado and getting it registered. So that was a little bit of a kerfuffle. So I think the rule we learned there is if you are trying to buy a car right now in this current market, you should be prepared to travel for it. So there's a good chance you'll be getting on a plane and flying out of state if you uh, want to find the best deal possible, which is typically a pretty good experience um, and, and typically ends up quite well if, if you talk to the dealer ahead of time and you can scope out uh, what they're like and whether or not they're going to give you a fair deal. Yeah, you just named, you know, I've got top five strategies to buying a new car, and that's number five. And as we go through this podcast, we'll count them down. So number five is uh, don't be afraid to uh, go to a dealership that's not in your neighborhood or not in your state. Um, you can do two things. You can make it into an adventure like we did, where we actually cross country did 500 miles to get it back to Colorado. Obviously, you have to have time and take off, you know, time from work if you're not doing it on the weekend. Or uh, we recently bought, um, well, we buy a lot of cars, but we recently bought a car in Florida, which is very far away from here. And we actually had a chip. And shipping cars is not that difficult. If you find a reputable shipper, it can cost anywhere from 750 to, let's say, if it's in Florida for us to go to Colorado, I think it was like $1,500. Uh, to you know, The farther it is, the more expensive it is. But in, in the scheme of things, if a dealer is asking 20 k over a Bronco, to find a, a dealership that's asking MSRP and then have the Bronco ship to your house is you know a lot cheaper. I will say, I'm, every time I have experience shipping a vehicle, it's it's, al it's always over fifteen hundred dollars. It's it's. I've it's, never seen one for under fifteen hundred dollars. The mini was a thousand. That Which we mini? shipped from the the GP. Yeah, well that that was also a debacle. And so I would actually recommend spending more on a reliable shipper than less on, a, on an unreliable one because the Chevy Spark came so late that we thought it was stolen. It came six days after. Uh, the guy said he dropped it off, so we were pretty convinced that he had just driven away with the car. So I actually I don't think shipping is the way to go, um, if at all possible. But that's not true. So we have I wouldn't go there far. Like for instance, Andre's uh, cousin has runs a shipping company where he ships cars in bulk between because a lot of people what they do is they'll go to Arizona from Colorado. So he does Denver to Arizona. Yes, yes. and he's fantastic at that. Yes, and it's but you know how much he charges for that? How much? Five hundred. I mean, that's super reasonable. And if you can find a guy like that, absolutely do it. But um, when we're not shipping cars between Denver and Arizona, Dad, I have to say it has always been a bad experience. We've well, never I, had a good experience shipping a car. Uh, name I, name I, one. The Saab was a bad experience. The Mini was a bad experience. The Spark was a bad it, experience. It, it depends. It depends. You know, the shipper you use and finding shippers can be tricky, but there are reputable shippers that will do it relatively quickly and on time. I mean, there's a lot of reputable shippers, um, and a lot of people will do it well. But you're going to have to pay for that service. If you well, then try, get, to, then get on a plane. If it, you try to do a budget one, like for 700 bucks, I think there's then, a good chance. How much is, is a ticket to California from here? Exactly, bucks. 250. Yeah. Yeah, get on a plane and drive it yeah, home. Yeah, that, I think I think that's the way to do it. And have an adventure. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, that's number five. We'll we'll, go, we'll kind of go down. Uh, number four, uh, we can go to number four right now. Is uh, use an expert. So uh, when, for instance, we recently bought another new car, which was the Crosstrek XV, uh, and this will lead up to the. Uh, to the one we bought for your grandma, and we bought that uh, using a car buying service here in Colorado, AAA. Uh, and we've been buying cars through them for a long time. Uh, one of the car buyers there is excellent. Actually, they're all really good. Uh, and he uh, got that car for us at the beginning of the summer uh, for under MSRP. Uh, and right now, that's unheard of, but it was 23.5. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a really great service. So uh, if you can find a good car buyer, the way that it works is you tell them what you want, you tell them exactly what you want. And if they're really good, they'll let you know exactly how much you're going to pay. And with like AAA here in Colorado, and I think the AAA does car buying in a couple states. They do it here in Colorado, and they also have a license, I think, in Oregon. So you have to look for car buyers in your state. But they deliver it to your office. You never touch a dealership. They bring all the paperwork in. You sign it at the office or at your home. Uh, and um, 
you know, you've agreed upon the price before the car is ever delivered. You cut them a check, you fill out the paperwork, they give you the keys, it's all done. None of the dealership, you know, mumbo jumbo, do you want the uh, undercoating for this? It'll only, you know, do you want the 15 year unlimited warranty? None of that. They just bring it, they give it to you, you pay, give them a check or financing if you're doing financing and it's done. Uh, and uh, it was a really great experience. I could highly recommend if you're in Colorado, AAA here. Uh, it's called AutoSource, I believe. And there's a lot of car buying services around the country. So do your research and find a reputable one. But it, it always is a fantastic experience. What we find is with the car buyers, sometimes to get the best deal, you do have to compromise a little bit on options and colors. So um, for example, with like AAA, uh, in the past when we've purchased cars from them, uh, we, we go to the uh, the gentleman we work with and he says, okay, you want a, uh, a cross trek and then he he goes through and he you know he talks to his sources and says well i found this 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 uh, this this and this cross trek um this one is a good price but it's a bad color this one is a uh, another good price but it doesn't have heated seats and you kind of have to to work with that a little bit because they're 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 working with their sources to get cars at good deals and that's our number three tip as we're getting down the list be prepared to uh, make compromises uh you know this car wasn't wasn't exactly the one we wanted uh, the color was good but it was a base car i wanted one with a little bit more options people people always asked us in the video that we did with it why didn't have this why didn't have that well because we had to make some compromises so be prepared to compromise if you're really set on getting a uh, cross track that's the sport that has you know that that crazy green color let's say that we reviewed it recently you may have to be willing to go for a color that, that you don't like, or you may have to be willing to go for a more expensive or less expensive option. When today, uh, you really can't be choosy. So if you're prepared to compromise, uh, you can potentially get what you're looking for. Um, and I think color is probably the biggest compromise. And, and, and of course, the model that you might have to make. And it's also worth noting too, that some of these car buyers can't actually get any cars in some situations too. So for example, we tried to use AAA to find my grandma a new car. Um, and we decided on a Hyundai venue, and and he just said, "Look, guys, I'm so sorry, but there's there's nothing we can do at this time. All the dealers are are just flat out of cars completely." So um, I, I think that th there's that possibility as well. Even though it's a fantastic service, they are still also limited with the inventory available. Yeah, it depends. I mean, once again, then you may have to compromise not just the color, but in fact the car that you're looking for. Right? You may have to be willing to change manufacturers stay within the segment or go to a different segment. I mean, that's just the way it is when you're in a tight uh, economy that we are in right now. Uh, so let's talk about your grandma's car and kind of talk about what happened when we went and bought that. So so my my mom, your grandma, wanted this Crosstrek. She was going to buy it from the company. We used it. We were done with it. We had done all the reviews. We finished up with, if you want to check it out, uh, we got a really fun uh, video where we actually towed with it. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we have a policy in place here that once we buy a car, if uh, one of the employees at the company wants to buy it, we'll sell it to him for whatever we paid for it. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, one of our videographer's uh, car, he had an old uh, Volkswagen that died, and he was like, hey, I want that car. And so we had already committed that car to him, uh, and so we had to go out and buy another car for my, well, not us, but we had to help your grandma, who is, by the way, in her late 70s, so just keep in mind this is a person who's not, uh, you know, in the in the, in the sharpest part of their life in terms of money making, right? They're living on a very fixed budget. Uh, and so we had to find her a car that was around 20K. And there aren't a lot of new cars around 20K, especially now. Right, so, so, so you came up with this idea. Tell them what you came up with. Yep, so I think they needed something very simple and they needed a key that was like a huge sticking point as they didn't want to push button start. So um, one of the, the few options which fit the bill perfectly, being the high ride height, the needing the key and very easy to use is the Hyundai Venue, which is this small high riding hatchback I describe it as. Fantastic little car, especially if you want something basic and simple. So um, we decided on a venue. We actually went to one of our car buying services, and they said uh, we can't we can't seem to find one in the system. So then you just happened to drive by our local Hyundai dealer, which looks like every other Hyundai dealer um, in the in the world right now, which is to say completely out of cars. And they had just unloaded basically five new Hyundai's. They had loaded. Uh uh, there were three uh, Palisades, mm -hmm. uh, one Kona, and one Venue. Yeah, so it was just super lucky that the, the day, the evening that you showed up, they had one that just got off the truck, still covered in its full protective wrap and all of its... And most of those cars were already sold. Um, and the reason the Venue wasn't sold is because it's Colorado and it's front-wheel drive. People here in Colorado really value all-wheel drive. Not that you don't sell front-wheel drives, but that's the, that's not the premium that, that, that people want. Obviously, we've got snow and mountains and... 
adverse driving conditions. So that night, um, we grabbed my grandma from her house, and she was all grumpy because she just made dinner. <laughs> so we dragged her to the dealership with my grandfather, and then um, came the process of trying to uh, secure the car, which turned out to be two and a half hours that night, and then four hours the next morning, um, which is just, unfortunately, if you go through dealer, everybody I talk to, it's almost always how it goes. Yeah, you know, you think you could just buy... so. Um, there are two manufacturers now where you can uh, circumvent the whole dealer thing. And keep in mind, uh, most dealerships are written into law. So over the years, uh, the dealerships uh, have actually got the states to write into law the fact that they can't be, uh, cars can't be sold without going through a dealership, uh, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but Tesla kind of came along and broke that model. They went actually to court and did a lot of the heavy lifting. And so now Tesla does sell cars direct off their website uh, in most states. I think there are two states where they still can't sell them. Mm -hmm. uh, and ironically, Tommy, one of those states is Texas where they're building their new factory. You figure if they're going to build a factory, they'd go to the legislature and say, hey, guys, we want to be able to sell our cars here. Well, don't, don't you think that was strategic? Don't you think that's probably coming? Maybe no, that's I think at this point they've already made the investment. Well, there. I'm thinking that's one of the reasons they chose Texas. And I think going down the road, we'll probably see some change in that rules. But yeah, you're exactly right. So there, there's laws in place that say if you want to buy a car, you have to go through a dealership. Yeah. But and that's for everybody. Like even, even though we have a great relationship with the manufacturers, we actually still have to buy through dealerships too. There's no circumventing it. So Tesla does sell direct to consumers, as does Rivian, which is a new electric truck company. Except for two states, Texas and Michigan. As does uh, Lucid. Yeah, Lucid is also going direct. Lucid so, is another so electric all the car new, company. Like so-called, like new manufacturing car companies are no longer manufacturing companies, Tommy. They're tech companies. Mm -hmm. They're selling tech, exactly. not cars and trucks. Yeah, exactly right. So... Um, they are able to go direct to consumers, but all the other established OEMs are still using the dealer network. And there are some pros of dealer networks. I don't want to make it sound like they're all bad. There are some really good ones out there. Yeah, but it's hard figuring out which ones those are. Right. And oftentimes, if you do find a good dealer um, and then you decide to change brands and you want a different brand car, there's a good chance that they're not going to have that brand within their network. So um, anyways, we, we brought my grandma and my grandpa to uh, this dealer in Boulder, and they said that they want to buy it, which was good because nowadays if you see a car that you're interested in, there's no going home and thinking about it. You pretty much have to decide on the spot. Yeah, and, and the dealer, because they knew all us, right, uh, they knew who we were, actually gave us a 70, $750 discount on the car. So it was. I think the sticker was 22 when we got it for like 21 250 which is pretty phenomenal. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for you know today's economics. Right. But that, I don't think, is representative of what most people are going to get. Well, and, and you know, the you other know, problem... You know, unless... Uh, the issue, that is is we have a YouTube channel with a million subscribers. Yeah, and the other problem, of course, is they had a trade-in, which was a 2000... What? 2006, I believe, Toyota RAV4? Right. With 100,000 miles, and we only got uh, 3,500 in trade for it. And I think that car was worth more like 1500 or 6000 right now. 1500 I mean, uh, $5,000 or $6,000, sorry. Yeah, I don't think so, Dad. This thing was pretty roached. Every yeah. panel had been crashed. Every but, panel had been dented. But it was a Toyota, and it only had 100,000 miles. And it had it was four-wheel drive. But uh, it had been crashed in the back. It had... <laughs> well, they fixed it. I mean, it was crashed and repaired. The front end was not very well repaired, though, we yeah, should they mention. They did do a good job repairing it. But nevertheless, I think, I think in today's market, 3500 for that RAV4 uh, with 100,000 yeah, miles was, was, it was, too uh, was, little. Uh, was on the low side. So, so you know, they, they giveth with one hand, but they take it with the other. And look, we didn't have to trade it in, right? That was, uh, you know, that was certainly well within our um, ability to sell it. I, I just, you know, I, I'm traveling so much, so are you. Uh, we're working so hard right now because for a long time there were really no new car introductions and no programs, and now they're all stacked up. Uh, to kingdom come. So it's just a matter of time versus money. And so once again, I think the reason people trade cars in is because it's easy and it's convenient. Uh, and then you can, you know, deduct the sales tax value of the trade-in, which that, helps a little bit. That was a whole other debacle, though, because they wanted to do just an old cash deal. Yeah, they were selling, the trade they were in, selling it weird. to a friend of theirs or something. Yeah, it was, so they didn't want it on the books. It was, it was very sketchy. Not, I, sh I shouldn't say they didn't want it on the books. I don't think that was the problem. I think they wanted to do, I don't know what that was well, about. Well, why wouldn't they just give us a credit toward the new car? Well, they gave us cash and then they applied the cash toward But he was very specific that he did not want to apply credit toward the new car. He wanted to give us cash 
and then have us because, pay him back that cash. Because he said he had a friend who wanted to buy it. I don't know. It was a little uh, it was a little odd. So anyway, so that's exactly what happened. But that, that wasn't my biggest problem with the deal. The, the, the problem was that we came in there at 6, and that night uh, we had done some of the paperwork. It took us two and a half hours. So by 8.30, everybody was leaving. The dealership was closing. And they said, let's get this done tonight. Uh, and then my mom had to go home, of course, and finish dinner. So she had to come back and sign the paperwork the next day. And they said, that's great because basically they'll have the car, uh, what's it called, prepared for us? Uh, PDI'd. So they'll, um, uh, what they do is they, they make sure that the car is in good condition from being you know, shipped all the way from uh, where they build it. And it's all covered in plastic. So they're supposed to take the plastic off. Um, they're supposed to wash it, fill it up with gas. It, it, it doesn't, it's not, I mean, on like a Porsche, it's probably a pretty big deal to make sure it's perfectly good. you don't think it's enough. on a venue? On a Hyundai venue, no. I think you pull some plastic off and off you go. Um, but so, so it was like, okay, we'll come back tomorrow. My mom will sign the rest of the paperwork. The car will be ready for you. And they said, come on at 8.30. And I was like, I don't think it'll be ready at 8.30. How about if we come by at 9? They were like, okay, come by at 9. Even though they said they get it in the shop first thing. First thing, yeah. They, 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 pour it, you know, they put it in the little service bay uh, like it's going to be ready. And then the next day, of course, I couldn't make it because uh, I had to work. But you were able to go and pick it up. So why don't we resume the story there? We, yeah, so the reason we couldn't get the transaction all done in one night was because my grandpa needed to go write the check. Oh, that's right. He needed a check, too. Yeah, yeah. he needed to go write the check. So we came back the next morning, handed him the check at, like, 9.30 uh -huh. in the in the morning, maybe even earlier. I think we showed up maybe 9.15. And uh, handed him the check, and they're like, all right, the car will be done soon. And we waited there till about 12 or 12.30. Wow. For them to pull the plastic off the car and fill it up with gas. And meantime, the entire sales staff, and I do mean pretty much the entire sales staff, was just hanging out behind the front desk on their phones, right? Um, and obviously, I mean, I'm sure they would claim it's not their job to go PDI the car. That's why they have the service department. Um, but he, the, the, our sales guy was like, yep, they're just filling it up with gas now. And that was a two-hour gas fill-up, <laughs> pretty much. Um, so basically, so he said he'd fill it up, and then I waited another hour and a half before I actually saw someone drive it off the lot. And I got really frustrated, and I was like, look, I know this isn't your job, but you're telling me that you can't go put $9 worth of gas in a Hyundai venue. Or just screw the gas. Just We could do it ourselves. I was just, it was ridiculous. So basically, it took us five and a half, six hours to buy a car. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. it, there was no financing involved. It was all cash. It was all cash. All cash. It was just trade a debacle. Yeah, yeah really I remember not you, a good you called me and you were you were you, know, you don't get mad, Tommy. You're, oh, you're, I was you're, livid. You're, well, because and the issue is that is they didn't PDA the car very well. So we pick it up um, from their little sales department, and there's plastic all over it still. The seatbelt still had plastic on it. The door panels were still covered in plastic. I'm like, what did you guys do for the last three hours, uh, other than put some so what gas did you in do, it? What did you do at the dealership for three hours? Just sat there. Wow. Yep, our sales guy went and talked to the other sales guys behind the front desk, and we just sat there for three hours. Wow, yeah, that's frustrating. And the car, when it showed up, like we saw it on the truck, um, it had plastic on the hood and the doors, but it was pretty clean. Like I would have been fine just taking it as it so, was. So th this is number two lesson in finding. You, you have to either through, uh, and this is really hard because it used to be that online reviews would actually be valuable and valid, but now a lot of online reviews are basically people either being paid to do these online reviews, in which case they're not objective, uh, or there's such a dearth of different companies doing online reviews that it's hard to know which one to trust. But the, the trick is you have to know if it's a good dealership or a bad dealership. I'm not saying this is a bad dealership. I'm just saying there are good eggs and bad eggs, and it's good to know going into a situation if this is one of the ones that is a good egg or a bad egg. So I, I don't want to you know, call out our local Hyundai dealership. I don't know. It could be great, but uh, it, it is good to go and do your research. So, for instance, when we buy uh, either Chevys or we buy Rams, we work with Johnson's um, Auto Plaza, which is out in Brighton, and they have been nothing but a joy to work with. I could highly recommend them. The problem, of course, becomes how do you know which is a good one? When we went to Albuquerque, uh, the mini dealership was great, like you said. They, right. pick, they picked us up uh, at the airport. They brought us to the dealership. The car was actually prepped and ready to go in kind of a delivery area, yeah, that was super, cool. super clean. Uh, the paperwork was done quickly. I think we spent less than an hour there and we were on our way. Uh, and that's, that's, that's a good tip, but it's even harder now because there's this incredible amount of consolidation happening. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but chances are any dealership near you now has changed ownership because mm. the, the like the, the big groups are buying the smaller groups, which are buying the independent dealers. And now you're getting these mega groups of dealers that are controlling uh, the dealerships. Uh, and so I think in our 
this this Hyundai dealership had recently been acquired by some some other group, so maybe they were going through some change. I know our local Jeep dealership has also changed hands. Yep. Uh, it's it's just a really uh, uh, turbulent time in the car sales business. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I just I don't know what the solution is there. I think that at some point too. Uh, you just have to choose a dealer. Just admit that you're going to spend six hours there and suck, <laughs> and suck it up. I mean, it's true though. I, I don't know what I don't know of a better solution. Every, pretty much, apart from the dealers we mentioned, every other time we bought a vehicle, it, it's always six hours, and you always feel like you're getting a bad deal. Do you remember what a disaster was buying that Ford Fiesta? Yeah, that was bad. That was a, the worst dealer experience yeah, I've so ever had. Yeah, so talk about that. So this was a couple of years ago. We, we did something that everybody out there hated. We traded a Raptor, right. first-gen Raptor. And our sales for, guy went off about like how the government was taking his guns because he almost shot his neighbor, and it was like... Well, just, I don't want to go into that. That's, it was a super weird thing, Dad. Yeah, that was weird. The weirdest part of that was... They actually, because the Raptor was worth more than the Fiesta, right? Right. We brought the title in. To, this is uh, a dealership in Longmont. We brought the title in. We did the deal. The next day, I bring the title to the truck in, and I think the dealership owed us, I want to say, you know, like, I forget now, fifteen to $17,000 or something, right? And I give them the title, and they were like, we can't give you a check because the person who signs the checks isn't here. And I'm like, wait, wait, hold on. I'm giving you the title to my truck. We had agreed that you owe me whatever it was, you know, X amount of thousands of dollars. And now you're not going to give me that check. And they'll say, no, we'll send it to you in two weeks. And I said, you know, and I, I was like, no, no, you know, the deal is dead. Right. That's not how you transact a deal. It's not my problem that the person. But hang on, Dad. You make this sound like this is a unique situation. This is uh, this happens all the time. If the person who signs a check is not in, there's a good chance you're not getting the check. It's just how it goes. Well, who knows if the person, maybe maybe their policy <laughs> at that time goes. was that, that they I don't... I just talked they, to they, someone they, else who just went through this exact same experience. They, they had to wait for them to send the check out. Yeah, I wouldn't have done it. I would have said, and I was you know, I was pretty adamant. I said, either give me the check or yeah, give me the keys got, to the Raptor. They got very mad at you. I remember that. There was yeah, this big, I got very this mad big at them. altercation. Yeah, it was not a good experience. That was just I mean, terrible. what's the upside to not paying you the money they owe you? And then there was another debacle with the key at the other Ford dealer with the Raptor that we bought. Oh, that was that where the other yeah. So the other debacle that we had, it, it, and maybe we're just unlucky. I'm trying to be generous, Tommy. So what happened was we bought a second generation Raptor from a dealer who we've done a lot of work with uh, here in Denver, uh, and, um, did and the, it, it, the paperwork was painless. Did the deal? The, the truck was sitting there, clean, ready to go. It was in front of the thing, once again in the delivery area. And then after I'd done the paperwork, after everything was done, I went to the truck. Uh, to go home and I turn it on and once again, you know, buyer beware, this is my stupidity, but nobody at the dealership bothered to mention the fact that the truck had a thousand miles on it. All right. And and I and I called and I said when I was looking for the truck, do you have a new raptor? He said, Yes, we have a new raptor. A truck with a thousand miles on it is not a new raptor in my book. Maybe in a dealership's well, I'm sure book it's a new raptor. It but was it, new in the fact that it had never been sold. Right. Right. So you were the first owner. And I'm but sure it's, it's, I'm sure you signed somewhere on a piece of paper an odometer disclosure that said this truck has 995 miles. I probably miles. did. You're probably right. I'm saying buyer beware. It's it's definitely on me. Right. But, but it would have been nice if the dealer said, hey, this truck has a thousand miles on it. Yeah, I agree. So um, and we don't have the second key to it. And this was before the whole chip thing. This was you know a year ago. I think they did make a second key though. Yeah, they did. They had a, they had to order it and give it to us, and they gave it to us. But it took. Took a while, but you know, it, it's just a, you just spend sixty three thousand dollars on a vehicle, and to find out that it's got a thousand miles on it, and you only have one key, right? After you purchase it, not before. Like, right. It's about expectations. It's no, about I managing agree. expectations. Uh, so you know that was also a painful experience, and I'm sure that there's a lot, um, a lot of experiences like that, and we'll see what happens, Tommy. You know, I mean, if I were to look into my my uh, my future, right? I would say that uh, we're living in a time where uh, the dealership model is, is somewhat broken. Uh, and if Rivian and if Lucid and if uh, Tesla can forego the dealership experience, how long will it be before one of the major manufacturers decides that you know, a dealer group dictating terms to them uh, is not something that they want to necessarily put up with? We'll because see. that's what's going to happen, right? I mean, if you're part of a dealer group that owns 150 dealerships, right, that, that's buying power. Uh, and that means that you're going to go. You're not going to be to the manufacturer, and you're not going to be like, "Hey, we want fewer Broncos." If you're a Ford dealership network, right? You're going to be like, "We want more Broncos because we're buying 150 worth of dealerships worth of Broncos." So what? What is number two and one? And number two. Down. Number two was. Uh, uh, what was number two? I just talked. We, we just talked about it. Oh, choose the right dealership. Okay, now what's number one? 
Um, number number one is uh, God, I just jumped out of my head. Keep talking. I'll, I'll, it'll it'll okay. come to me in a second. Well, I'm not sure what your number one is, but my number one is don't buy a new car right now. Uh, um, if you can if you can put it off, I genuinely think that this is just across the industry, not to you know poo on dealers and to, to talk about you know how how bad the experience. Well, what if you need be? a new car? What if you can't? What if you need one to get to work? Well, I mean, I, I would I mean, do there, everything in your people, power there, to figure out a better solution. There's some people who just need a new car. Well, it, and it's that's going to get worse and worse as time goes on. I mean, there's just no good solution. That at this point, you might be better off trying to find a used car, even though used cars are crazy through the roof. Get a used Grand Cherokee, because apparently Grand Cherokees, the one vehicle I own, are the ones that are not appreciating in the crazy market. No, but seriously, um, it's just, it's, it's, it's not a good time to get a fair deal on a new car. It just is really, really a bad time. Um, so I will p just put it off as long as you can. So that, that is my, my tip, because at some point, in my opinion, it, the, 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 the chip problems are going to sort out, right? And we're going to be up at a point where you can purchase new vehicles again at at MSRP or below MSRP. But it, it's to the point oh, now... Oh, I, I, know, I know what number one is. Go ahead. It, but it's at the point now where buying a new car is going to cost you a huge amount of money. All right, number one was, uh, you know, it used to be kind of when you went and bought a new car, um, you were in the position of power, right? So you were the one who'd walk in the dealership and the salesman would walk you around and, you you know, there'd be 100 cars on the lot and you'd, you'd kind of pick and choose the one that you wanted. Uh, and uh, then you could potentially negotiate uh, the, 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 on the car, and then you could play dealerships off one another. Uh, and it was, if you were into that, and there's some people who really thrive on that, right? That was a, f a fun way to spend a Saturday afternoon. Now, it's the exact opposite. Obviously, the dealership is in the position of power because they have the supply, and you have the demand, and you have a lot more demand than supply. So uh, the, the thing about buying a new car, the number one tip is look at it as a job, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, and do your research. And that means if you want to do um, a new car now, you have to go and call dealers. You have to figure out which dealers are, you know, the best in the marketplace. You may have to go and, you know, fly somewhere. You may have to call uh, and uh, talk to car buying services. Uh, and then the last tip I had, you, you can also work with like these larger car buying services, which are places like Costco. So these have relationships that, that go beyond the dealership network with, with, the, um, with the manufacturer, right? Uh, and so take a look at that. Go to Costco and see what they can do for you because there is, um, there is strength in, in numbers, right? And Costco is buying a lot of different cars for a lot of their members. Uh, so try that service as well. That's a car buying service, but it's a much bigger, broader than an individual. Uh, and, and look at it as it's going to take work. It's just going to take work. And you're going to have to be prepared to either ship a car or either fly somewhere if you want uh, to buy a new car. And this is, n this is pretty much any new car. It's not just, not just you know, your dream car. It's any new car. It could be a Hyundai Venue. The issue is that is, I think for most dealerships and for most people I've been talking to, most of the new cars that are coming to dealers are pre-sold before they even show up. Like I said, that in that Hyundai, three of the five are pre-sold. Right, exactly. I, I mean, I, I really, if you can just put it off just wait wait a few months, wait even up to a year, you know, and try to, to stretch your, your current vehicle as far as you can because it's just it's an absolutely painful time to be doing this. And it shouldn't be because it's a major life purchase. It's the, the second most expensive thing that you probably will buy other than your house. So um, just just be patient and just wait. That's all I can tell you. All right. Well, let's uh, do what me and Nathan have been doing in, in the last, uh, let's say, 15, 20 minutes of the time that we have, uh, and that is do some quick car reviews. We've had a bunch of different cars at the office uh, that you've had a chance to review, Tommy. So let's go through the cars that we've had and kind of give you a quick review of each of them. Uh, so if you're in the market for a new car and you're willing to do work, and some cars actually probably are out there. So uh, yesterday, uh, Friday, you just reviewed the new convertible E-Class Mercedes. Tell me about that. Yep, another one you can't buy. <laughs> what do you mean you can't buy? You just can't buy anything. Have you seen the Mercedes dealer? It's just it's a ghost town. Well, well let's talk about the car and let's it's it's, it's and let's talk about uh, what it cost and what you thought of it. Yeah, so the E53 Cabriolet is the Mercedes E-Class convertible. This one was ninety five thousand dollars, which is a huge amount of money. It's the 53, so it has a three liter straight six. I think it's like four hundred and twenty horsepower, somewhere in that territory. And it was great. Really, really liked it. Nine-speed automatic transmission is a true four-seater convertible, which is super rare in today's market. Like its com competition has long since gone away for the most part, like the BMW 6 Series. But uh, yeah, I was really overall very impressed with the E-Class convertible. I thought it drove quite nicely. It was 
plenty quick. I think it's a little expensive, but if you want a beautiful four-seater convertible, it's hard to beat. Yeah, you know, I had a chance to take that for a ride around town as well, and uh, I've got a soft spot now as I get older for convertibles. I didn't used to like them, and now I can't seem to get enough of them for some reason. Uh, maybe I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, I can still uh, feel youthful in a, in a, in a topless car, uh, but I love that car. I thought, you know, even though it's not the AMG 63, right? Do they even make an AMG 63 version of that? I think they, so. Do they really? Yeah, I think they do an E-Class e AMG uh, in the 63. In the convertible? Oh, I don't know if they do a convertible. Yeah, they may not. Um, Maybe one, one, one bridge too far. But So its competition is kind of like the 8 Series maybe BMW, but that's a lot more expensive. That starts, that starts at 94000 Yeah, I mean, what's cool about it is, of course, uh, it actually has room. There's a lot of convertibles that are either two-seaters or like a 911 that has you know the seats in the back where you can kind of get a set of golf clubs in there or maybe... I don't know, some groceries, but they're certainly not meant for people. Um, one of my favorite cars, and I know this is a guilty pleasure, was the Buick Cascada, which was actually a rebadged Opel four-seater convertible, and yeah. that was like the last affordable true four-seater convertible you could get. Like the Sebring's gone, or the 200, right? Um, uh, so getting a four-seater convertible where you can actually get four people is uh, very hard nowadays. So you can do a C63 and an S63 Cabriolet, but the E is only uh, yeah, 53. 53. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, you, you are alone on that Cascada Mist thing, Dad. I do not understand that vehicle at all. That was a... Uh, oof. I do not understand the appeal of the Buick Cascada. Remember for a time there, uh, like, four-seater convertibles were all the rage. Like, you know, think about all the giant American four-seater convertibles, like the Lincoln Continental. Remember that? Um, to be honest, Dad, I, I was not alive in, in well, didn't, 1967. Did you watch Entourage? I have not seen Entourage, so that is a little bit before my time. I do remember when like the Sebring and the Chrysler 200 convertible were around. But no, that's a little, that, that's not something I typically remember. All right. Yeah, I do not remember 1967 very well. Maybe you do. I was very young. You were four. Yeah, I was very young. I think that was the last year of the, the four-door convertible Continental. Anyway, I really enjoyed that car, uh, and um, yeah, it was great. Now, I, we've been on a bunch of different programs, so I was recently uh, driving, uh, thank you, Porsche, all four Boxsters. Did you know there are four Boxsters now you could buy? Yeah, very cool, Dad. Yeah, there's uh, the the 718T, which is the little, uh, well, little, it's a four-cylinder uh, turbo. Uh, now, and then there's, of course, the 4-liter uh, GTS, which is basically you go from 300 horsepower in the 718T to the GTS where from 300 to 400 horsepower, so you gain 100 horsepower and two more cylinders. Uh, then there's the one that I fell in love with, which is the 25th Anniversary uh, Boxster, which is uh, GTS-powered. Um, beautiful vehicle. It has, uh, um, you know, 25th Anniversary touches and badges and only building 1250 of them i drove number either two or number six of 1250 uh, those things are going to appreciate like crazy uh, because they're very limited production and then of course there's a spider version of it as well yeah the spider is uh that's the one you liked yeah that that's i think that's very, the, the very coolest one but it also starts at ninety eight thousand dollars. yeah i actually have all the if you give me a second here i've got all the uh, specs on the four different kinds and i can tell you the difference between them if you're interested tommy are you interested can I tell you about them? So uh, the 2-liter turbo has uh, 300 horsepower, 280 pound-foot of torque. It comes with a manual short-throw uh, shifter or a PDK, 20-inch uh, S wheelies and titanium. Uh, chassis is based, of course, on the 718 GTS, 0 to 16, 4.9 with the manual or 4.5 with the PDA. Top speed, 170 miles an hour. Uh, and, of course, uh, it's got nylon door pull straps, believe it or not. Right. Make it lighter. Uh, 71000 Then you can go work your way up if you can get any of these, which you can't. But if you could, think about the fact that they're not at the dealerships right now. But when they will be, there's the 4-liter, GTS 4-liter. That's 394 horsepower, 309 pound-foot of torque. Uh, manual or PDK, 20-inch uh, wheels again. It's got the... Uh, PSM sports suspension, this time 0 to 16, 4.3 for the, wow, for the manual, or get this, 3.8 for the PDK. Uh, track top speed, what do you think? 190. 182. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, starts at uh, uh, 89.5. There you have it. Then you go up to the uh, Boxer 25 years. It's a funky name. Um, once again, same horsepower as the other GTS. Uh, 
Uh, this one was designed by Grant Larson. You know who Grant Larson is? No idea. He's the guy who designed the very first Boxster. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, he kind of saved Porsche in some ways with that. Uh, and uh, MSRP of 100 k Once again, if you could find one, one of 1,250 units. Uh, and then finally, the 718 Spider. Once again, four liter. That one's up on power, 414 horsepower, 309 pound foot of torque, manual or short throw PDK, uh, 1220 uh, spider wheels uh, with UHP tires. I think those are high performance tires. Front axle is shared with the 911 GT3, dude, the 991. A flight wheel shared with the GT3. I drove that as well. Uh, chassis developed by Porsche Motorsports starts at $98,000 and it has rear axle. Uh, helper springs. That is, of course, the most track-focused of the Boxsters. Right. I think it looks the best, too. It's it's a very cool-looking vehicle. Yeah. You're showing it up there. Yeah, you got that little, like, uh, double humpback. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. It looks and fantastic. The fly, and the flying buttress. The, the, the issue I had with it is, so Porsche took us to uh, California, uh, and we were in Malibu, kind of above, you know, in the canyons, and we got to do, like, this loop in the canyons and then a little stretch on Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, you know, for me, the Boxster has never been, like, a, a track car. If you're going to go for the track version, get the uh, uh, Cayman, right? Uh, and so that one is just a little too on the harsh side. I, I shouldn't say harsh, on the sporty side, right? A, a boxer to me is something that you go on a Sunday drive. Uh, the the Spider is certainly the one you would take if you wanted to go, I don't know, do a, a autocross or do a track day. Uh, but to me, if you're going to do that, just go for a 911 or a Cayman. I think the reason that these are significant is I have a feeling these might be the very last naturally aspirated flat sixes that Porsche will ever build because if you look at like the 911 those are now all turbocharged um, so it was just like it drove enthusiasts crazy when they brought it back because it was such a big deal to have a flat six in a vehicle without turbos again because um, for a while there it left the Boxster came lineup altogether they only went to four cylinder turbo so love the fact that they, they are still sticking with some of that heritage there but I'm not sure that that is going to be around for much longer. So I, I was really um, thrilled to be on this program to have to drive all four back to back. The way it worked is we had an hour and a half to do an hour loop. And it was just a pure pleasure to be in California, beautiful weather, uh, top down, except for the first loop where it was a little cold uh, to be driving these cars. And um, they had the original Boxster, which came out in 97. Um, and uh, they had recently bought it from, guess who, Tommy? Jerry Seinfeld. Yep, it was a, a $40,000 MSRP car originally, but then uh, Seinfeld's was, uh, of course, um, he bought, he wasn't, he didn't buy the first boxer, he bought the first one coming into the U.S., and then they bought it back from him like a year ago. His was 65, apparently, with all the uh, carbon fiber bits and all the upgrades that he had on his. Uh, so they had uh, his there, the first American Boxster, next to the 25th anniversary Boxster set up. If you want to see the video, it's over at TFL Car. Um, I kind of did a walk around of both of them. Uh, and it was really cool to see how far the Boxster had come. And the question I was asking myself, and this is a question that maybe you, if you're a Porsche enthusiast, would be asking, is the Porsche Boxster now its own car. In other words, for a long time, it was kind of the baby brother of the 911, be it the convertible. Uh, has it become its own thing now? And I think it has. Yeah, I think most people would say it has too. Yeah, I, think, it I think it actually, I think from the launch, it has kind of had its own personality. So I love that it's 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 hanging around. It's been around for 25 years and hopefully for another 25 more. Yeah, the, the difference after driving all four of them that I could best describe to you between the four models is the four cylinder turbo right the 718t uh it feels like it's the baby brother to a miata if that makes sense it's very light it's very nimble uh it's got enough power to, to you know to, to be fun uh, but not enough to terrify you um so it's kind of like i say like if you had a if you had a miata that would be its baby brother uh, and then if if you move up to the gts which feels much heavier and much more substantial um that one feels like the baby. So the the, the 718 feels like the older brother to the Miata, whereas the GTS 4 liter feels like the younger brother to the 911. Okay. So I, I know that's kind of mixing metaphors and brands, but that's how it that's how it was. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about one more uh, that you recently drove. Tell me about the Mercedes Electric S Class. I think we talked about this last time, didn't Did we? Did we talk the about EQS? it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a luxury um, four-door sedan that is you supposed sure to... sure we talked about it? It's supposed to compete with the Lucid and the Porsche Taycan. So it, it starts at over $100,000. 
but it is the kind of the, the flagship Mercedes luxury luxury sedan. It's pretty cool. Goes about 350 miles on a single charge. There's two models. There's the 450 and the 580. So one does zero to 60 in the mid five second range. The other one does it in the mid four second range. It's got a hyper screen, so it's got 56 inches of interior screen, and it is one heck of a car that kind of looks like a bar of soap. But people actually in person seem to really like the design. So. It's a little polarizing at first, but um, when you see it in person, it really does look cool. Yeah, I, I thought we talked about the new Mazda. I know we talked about that for sure. I didn't oh, think maybe, we, talked, I maybe didn't, we did. I didn't think we talked about the Mercedes. Okay, but um, uh, yeah, a very, very cool car. It is kind of the ultimate S-Class by mine. It's got air suspension, which is super softly sprung. So uh, you kind of just float down the road. It's very different than the Model S and the Taycan. It makes no... Um, preconceptions about being sporty it's just incredibly soft feels super well made it's the quietest car i've ever driven and it almost feels like a 1960s mercedes and that it just wafts along in utmost quality and refinement so very excited about it you can get it in either all-wheel drive or rear wheel drive depending on the configuration um, lots and lots of different technologies inside if you get the hyperscreen like we said 56 inches it's got a screen in front of the passenger it's got like 18 inches of screen in the middle screen in front of the driver as well um, no buttons on the interior for the most part no volume knob either they've gone to this little slider control thing oh i hate sliders um, and even like the seat controls now have little touch sensitive controls so they're, they're not like traditional buttons so uh, very very well executed though uh, some of these other kind of haptic display stuff are, are pretty bad but uh, Mercedes just nailed it with the UI experience in the EQS I would get it all day long over a standard S class I think that having that electric refinement brings the uh, EQS up to another level and if you can get over the looks, which I grant you are a little bit weird, and if you can get over the fact it doesn't have a front trunk unlike the Porsche or the Tesla, it is truly a phenomenal piece of engineering. All right, there you go. Oh, yeah. yeah it's yeah. really, really good. All right. Uh, it's great to see the electric car wars heating up. Finally, you know, Tesla has some competition. Um, so in the last 15 minutes, after less than that, that we have in this podcast, uh, I want to save the last thing that you drove, which is this tiny Mitsubishi Pajero. You drove like a Japanese <laughs> tiny Pajero. So I want to, that video is up on TFL Classics. Uh, but let's quickly uh, talk about uh, the f car that we're saying goodbye to, which is another Mercedes, and that's your Mercedes, Tommy. You're selling your, uh, your, your classic Mercedes. Tell me about bought it and where is it being sold and why are you selling it? Yep, so if you are looking for kind of that 1970s experience, um, I am selling a uh, my personal 123 Mercedes, which is a diesel sedan, super popular in the 70s and 80s. And this is a really clean example. It's over at Bring a Trailer and there's a video over at TFL Classics. Uh, if you just search TFL Classics on YouTube, you'll find it pretty quickly and that's got all the auction info. But love the car. Uh, it was supposed to be my forever car, but I kind of feel like I've owned it and experienced it and now it's time to move it on to someone else. And move on to bigger and better adventures. So if you are uh, looking for for um, a pretty cool 123, you're welcome to own mine. Yeah, you know, uh, over the last 11 years, we've owned a lot of different cars. And for me, the most, uh, I will watch like chasing classic cars, right? And always the saddest experience is when like Wayne finds a car that some guy owned where the car somehow broke, it's like a classic Ferrari, and then he put it in the garage, and then he just sat in the garage because it was too expensive to fix, and then he developed some kind of crazy disease, and he died, and it sat in the garage some more, and then his widow finally calls Wayne, and then Wayne pulls it out of the garage and takes it, fixes it up, and sells it at Mila Island. That That is not the ideal uh, classic car ownership experience, so we've kind of changed that, I think, here at TFL. I've kind of, I've had this epiphany, right, that the most fun moments of buying classic cars are the chase, right, the fixing, and the selling. Those those are the three, like, highlights. Those are the three best moments. So finding it, fixing it, and then passing it on to somebody else. And what you can do when you do that, when you don't feel like you have to hold on to it until Father Time has his way with you, uh, you can actually experience a lot more classic cars. Uh, and so what we try to do, at least what I try to do, is, you know, find one, fix it up, pass it along to a new home, and then use that money and go to the next one. And because of that, you can experience a lot more cars than having like a, a warehouse full of classic cars like like most people do, like like say Jay Leno's garage. I mean, he's got you know hundreds of cars that he just holds on to. But the fact is, if you think about it, I mean, you don't own them cars. They own you at some point. They're going to outlive you. So why not experience as many as possible? You know, the 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 
the, the having and holding on to them is actually the worst part, I think, in some ways of, of, of owning these classic cars. So I'm proud of you that you're moving on. And because of that, you actually bought a new car. Well, a new classic car. I wouldn't say it's classic, but yeah, I moved on to another Mini, uh, 2003 Cooper S, which I think are fantastic cars for the money. Um, and, and I think those will also one day be pretty collectible because they were the first of the BMW era Mini and they're just the smallest and the most fun, in my opinion. So that is what I am currently driving. Um, but yeah, the Mercedes has been phenomenal. Great ownership experience. And I hope someone else has the chance to enjoy it as much as I did. Yeah, good job, Tommy, passing it on to somebody Thanks. else. Thanks. Yeah. No, it'll be good. I think I think it's time for it to go to yeah, a new you, home. Yeah, you got, to, you got to spend a couple summers with it. You got to drive it around. You got to feel what it was like driving a diesel Mercedes in the 70s. And, of course, that feeling is slow. <laughs> no, it's good. I really do like it. I really do enjoy the experience. It's a great car to drive. But, uh, yeah, it's time to let someone else drive it. So I think with that... Well, there's two things that are happening this week we need to talk about before we say goodbye. Okay. Uh, number one, uh, the new Civic Si is coming out, and Alex actually flew uh, to California last week to get hands-on with the Civic Si. So that video is going to be out on TFL Car, a premiere. We're premiering it because it's a new uh, Civic Si. You know, Civic Si doesn't come along all that often. Uh, and then Andre actually flew to Detroit last week and did what? I have no idea. He got a new GMC truck, so I don't oh, know. If, I don't. I don't know. Which, I don't know if I can talk about. I think I can. I think. I think people know that there's a new GMC ish coming. I'm not saying what it is. I'm just saying if you if you tune into truck this week, you'll see something premiere there as well. All right. All right. I just don't want to break any embargo rules. Um, uh, and then uh, we've got the last episode of For a Few Bucks Less, where we actually go up and over Imogene Pass, where uh, we've got the Mazda pickup versus. Nathan's Blazer versus your Jeep uh, Grand Cherokee, and that's coming up on Friday as well. So, I mean, on Sunday as well this week. So, lots of really fun videos. So, be sure to stay tuned. Yep, and thank you guys for watching. And if you want all that in one place, I was just there. Go to tfl-studios.com. Thank you to our Patreon members uh -huh. who help support this. And thank you to you guys for watching and listening. As always, this is Roman. And Tommy, we'll see you next time. Ciao.